Welcome to the Gastro Girl Podcast. We bring together patients, experts, and health advocates who are all here to help you optimize your health. Here's your host, Jacqueline Gollin. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us on today's episode. This is an interesting episode. We're going to talk about the role of the pharmacist in a GI clinical practice. And this is something we've never really talked about on our podcast. So we're here today joined by Dr. Tasif Ali, who's a gastroenterologist, as well as Ms. Carrie Breeden, who's also with SSM Health. She's the regional director of ambulatory pharmacy and population and her colleague, Sarah L. Cabasi, and she's an IBD clinical pharmacy specialist also at SSM Health. I'm so excited to have all of you from the SSM Health team here on the Gastro Girl podcast. This is such a unique um, episode today, and I, I thank Dr. Ali for suggesting this really interesting topic. First of all, you know, I, a lot of people don't realize uh, all the schooling that pharmacists need to go through to do what you do on a daily basis. So why don't we start there? Like, how did you both become pharmacists? So the foundation of um, becoming a pharmacist is getting a PharmD degree or doctor of pharmacy. And so that typically involves, you know, completing pre-pharmacy courses. And that the number of years depends on what school you're at, uh, followed by four years of professional education. So after those four years of professional education, then you take your state licensing um, exams, which kind of sets the stage for your career in pharmacy. And then after that, if you're interested in a more specialized or clinical role, uh, you can pursue postgraduate residencies or fellowships. And those really allow us to gain uh, more direct patient care skills, um, engage in collaborative drug therapy management, um, and just obtain additional education beyond those four professional years. And so I personally completed the PGY-1 pharmacy practice residency that I really feel like has allowed for broad experiences and, you know, prepared me for many different types of pharmacist roles. Well, that's so impressive. Now, Carrie, what is the role of a pharmacist in healthcare besides what we traditionally see, you know, going to a, a drugstore like CVS or Walgreens? What's the difference and how do you work with someone like Dr. Ali, for instance? Yeah, yeah. Really, um, you know, over the last I five, say five to 10 years, the image of the pharmacist is really transitioning to um, more of a less behind the counter role and more of an integral multidisciplinary part of the team role in the clinics. And so, you know, really clinical pharmacists, I mean, they are now involved in all areas of practice and uh, mainly for uh, primary care. And then of course, as in this instance in the IBD clinic, um, having the clinical pharmacy specialist there to help, you know, take care of the conducting the, um, comprehensive medication reviews, providing education to the patients, um, providing support peer-to-peer -peer reviews, which I think Sarah will probably touch on, but really the clinical pharmacist role has, has grown and uh, we're just really excited to be pushing, you know, our role um, in the forefront of, you know, helping in clinic. I find this so fascinating. Now, Dr. Ali, you know, with GI patients, a lot of, a lot of time there's comorbidities. They have severe, say, IBD, but they may have a heart condition or they may have other conditions. So can you explain how critical it is to work closely with um, the pharmacist in healthcare in your practice? That's an excellent question about uh, the role of a pharmacist in the field of gastroenterology um, or digestive health. And then in particularly, uh, when you are looking at subspecialties like inflammatory bowel disease programs or um, hepatologist or uh, hepatitis clinics or liver clinics um, or liver transplant clinics, uh, the role of pharmacist is evolving. And it's very it's becoming critical for, for different uh, factors. One, uh, from the practice uh, point of view, that um, the rising cost, the complications that are happening in terms of uh, a very convoluted healthcare system, uh, the payers, um, their their policies um, that you really need to leverage on um, a pharmacist to help uh, run the practice um, when it comes to um, the the logistical support. Then, from a patient perspective, um, as uh, Carrie and Sarah were touching, that you know the patient education, the counseling that happens. Uh, 
um, it works both way. Uh, we have patients with polypharmacies, right? So they, there's a lot of drug interactions that can happen uh, that a pharmacist can really help streamline. One good quick example is like when we give a medication cholestyramine. Uh, it has a lot of drug interactions and it's a medication that sometimes we use for patients with diarrhea and, and it, it interacts with a lot of medications. So a pharmacist can sit down and can develop a program or a scheduling program with the patient when to take that medication. Similarly, there are many IBD medications, some new medications that even interact with the food and, and they have food interactions. So a pharmacist can really play a critical role in helping patient educate patients, uh, taking their medications properly, compliance, adherence are other things that a pharmacist can really help patients. And then patients have a lot of questions about, you know, their copay assistance, medication assistance program. So a pharmacist can also play a critical role uh, in that. So these are all patient related factors. And then from a physician's perspective, uh, when we have a very busy clinical practice, uh, a pharmacist can play a very critical role. Another good example is H. pylori treatment. It includes some antibiotics. You have to take this a course of 14 days. Some of our patients have kidney issues. Some of our patients are on dialysis. Some of our patients are taking medication. Some of our patients have penicillin allergies. So the H. pylori oh. treatment can become really complicated and a pharmacist can spend some time, can streamline the regimen for our patients and can ease our practice so that we can uh, be more productive uh, from revenue point of also, and also can provide a very good quality care to our patient um, from that perspective. So that's how I see the role of pharmacists, that how critical that role is in, in a digestive health, uh, and they can play a very important role, improving the quality as well as uh, bringing um, an extra layer of, uh, um, you know, protection to the patient also. Well, this is, it's important that we're talking about this today because there's so many things on the market. There's so many different kinds of medications, like you said, even food. And then you have people taking supplements and, you know, drinking all sorts of, you know, there's probiotics and everything. And people are just, you know, taking those energy drinks. So to have someone like, Carrie and Sarah in a practice, especially in a GI practice, is is critical. And I, I I'm glad we're bringing this to the attention to the forefront uh, of our of our listeners today. So in a, in your practice, um, and you, when you work Carrie and Sarah with Dr. Ali, like how do you does a patient request a pharmacist, or how does that work? Like if I'm a patient in your practice, and I'm nervous because now you assign me maybe three or four different treatments and I'm like oh my god I don't want to take these like they play you got you ladies play a really important role and I'm that patient I never like to take anything I'm like always the one that's googling and how many million things are going to happen to me but walk us through what that scenario would be like if 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 a patient got you know three or four prescriptions from Dr. Ali uh and now they're nervous like how do you how do you step in and kind of alleviate with the education component the fears I always talk to them about how, you know, the things they can read on Google and other areas of the internet are not always the side effects that are most prevalent. You know, they might have happened to just a couple of people in the studies, and we really spend our time focusing on what the most common side effects are, and then a couple of serious side effects in general for these specific medications that they can keep an eye out on or keep us updated about. And so generally, once we talk about those things, they feel a lot better. Um, a lot of them are scared to start some of these new medications, uh, especially the biologics, because of what they read online. And so I am really lucky um, in the sense that I usually get anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour to really talk to them oh, wow. and try to help them alleviate their fears and find out exactly um, what the root of their problem is their fear is. And so, you know, we have some patients who are really afraid of infections. I just had a patient like that a month or two ago. And so after going through all of the different options with him, he decided that something like Intibio would make him feel more comfortable as compared to the other options that he had at the time. And so we really just spend time going over patient specific and medication specific factors to help them feel the most comfortable. Well, what's alarming, not alarming, but what's surprising is that you're often spending more time with the patient 
discussing these than the physician has time, unfortunately. So you're really working in tandem with someone like Dr. Ali. And that's as a patient, and I'm sure our listeners, they feel like this is this is great news because we often feel sometimes that we don't have enough time with our doctor. Dr. Ali uh, really sets the stage for the pharmacist and and you know his interaction that he has with his patients. He he decides, hey, you know, this is going to be a good candidate for pharmacist intervention and education. You know, I really like what you touched upon about the pharmacist being able to spend a little bit more time with the patients because a lot of times they're getting so much information in that short amount of time with the provider visit and Dr. Ali is saying, okay, we're going to do this and this and this. And I think that probably there's a lot of information going in. And so I think it's good to have the pharmacist be able to come through after Um, They've had that initial appointment and be able to take that time to really go through and answer a lot of the questions. And then also just review the regimen because, you know, sometimes I think they're kind of overwhelmed um, and don't catch all of that. Um, And so having the pharmacist be able to step in um, and really help educate the patient and provide some more understanding. And and Sarah's Sarah's one of our great ones to be able to do that and provide the compassionate care that, you know, these patients really need. So this is something new to me. I didn't know, Dr. Arley, that you can actually refer a patient to speak to um, a pharmacist like Carrie or Sarah. Can you explain how that works? And is this normal in every, every practice or this is this unique to what you're doing? Yeah, so it is unique. It's it's happening in other healthcare systems also. So it's it's being recognized how critical it is to have a pharmacist um, in 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 the practice. Um, so there are different steps, and uh, I'm I may not be very well versed as a physician. So Miss Carey and Miss Sarah can chime in later once um, I I walk you through how we actually developed this. Um, so so the first thing is that um, there are programs where they have pharmacists, but they don't have a CPA or collaborative practice agreement. So the 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 scope of practice of a pharmacist is just like a counseling. Uh, but when you have a CPA in which is a I said that the collaborative practice agreement, which is a, a standard legal document that authorizes the clinical pharmacist to perform certain patient care services under a supervision of a physician. So once you have that agreement, then I will just walk you through different scenarios that how I am utilizing the services of a pharmacist. So if I see a patient in practice, it's a new patient to my practice, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease patient, and we are talking about different drug options because the patient has active disease. Now, I may not have time. I may be constrained by the time and I want my patient to know more about it. I will take my patient to Sarah, introduce my patient to Sarah that this is Sarah. She will be seeing you and have another visit with you, walking you through all these different drug options that we discussed so that you can make even a smarter decision than today's uh, encounter. I can drop a referral and that referral goes to our um, coordinator. So we have a uh, biologic coordinator who is um, helping Sarah's schedule. So uh, that's another important critical piece is that from the revenue point of view and also making sure that Sarah remains productive and efficient, that someone runs her schedule and schedule patients visits. So she actually has a schedule uh, in our electronic health record system and she can schedule patients. Let's say if I see a patient, she can call the patient next day. It's like, hey, it was nice meeting you or seeing you uh, yesterday. And I can either do a televisit with you or I can see you in person. So Sarah then spend a time with them in the patient room going over their medical history, uh, then going over their medication history, then going over the side effects, safety profile, even issues like pregnancy, lactation, fertility. So she goes over all these issues with the patient. So patients are very well informed to make a decision. If they are on a medication, so let's say if a patient is on a medic biologic therapy and now they're flaring up and I need to do some therapeutic drug monitoring, I need to adjust their dose. That's again, Sarah plays a critical role. I tell my patients that, you know what? Let's have Sarah look at all these things that we discussed today and she can order 
order these labs for you and then we will make that decision together. So Sarah takes a lot of responsibilities off my shoulder in a very smart, intelligent and efficient way so that we can provide the best care to those patients. Even not only it stops there where it comes to the prescriptions and medications, Sarah then also helps with vaccinations, preventive health care, and setting up reminders that, so my patient is coming, let's say if I have a patient um, day before yesterday, a patient comes to my clinic and I see a popping reminder on my screen saying that this patient is due for his, this, this, this labs. So, so that's another way of uh, utilizing uh, services of a pharmacist. In future, we are looking and evolving this role of a pharmacist for clinical trials. Many patients, uh, may benefit from a clinical trial and a pharmacist can identify those patients that, you know what, you may be a very good candidate for a clinical trial medication because you have uh, utilized these, this drug or you are unable to afford this drug. So let's put you on a clinical trial. So, so the role of clinical pharmacist is really, really evolving uh, but you really need to um, have a system in place so that you can maximize uh, the uh, the utilization of a pharmacist. So just not have a pharmacist, but have some processes set up where you have the pharmacist working under your guidance and supervision, and you're just improving these processes. This is so fascinating. I'm so impressed with what you guys have done. And I, I wish all patients had access to this type of care, collaborative care team. You know, what What do you say to the patient who's listening? Like, ah, I wish my doctor referred me to a, a pharmacist. Like, what is your recommendation for those patients? Can they just go to a retail pharmacy and, and have the same engagement? Or is it a little different? Obviously, you have certain GI expertise that many of may not have. Yeah. yeah, I you know, I think patients really will have to just be their, you know, the big voice for saying, hey, we, you know, we want this, we want to have a pharmacist in our clinic, you know, again, this is a more of a, a newer uh, in the forefront of patient care activity that we're kind of providing here as Dr. Ali's, you know, stated you know, this is new for, for us and, a, for you know, to have a pharmacist in an IVD clinic. And I think that a lot of patients with, you know, they enjoy speaking to their pharmacist because that's, you know, they see their pharmacist more, their, you know, their community pharmacist, they see them more than they see um, any of their healthcare practitioners. So I think just being an advocate and, and letting, you know, um, your providers know that this is something that, you know, they would love to have. Um, again, you know, and for the providers out there, you know, be a strong advocate for this. Dr. Ali has been a very strong advocate for having the pharmacist in clinic and, and he, he understands the, the value that pharmacists bring. So, you know, really the, the providers are our biggest, biggest advocates for having a pharmacist in clinic. So now, now I think GI, I'm not biased, but I think gastroenterology is a fascinating specialty area of medicine and What's also fascinating is the evolution of therapeutics that are becoming more and more personalized and targeted, right? So that's going to, even in IVD and things going on with the microbiome, it's really evolving. And the role for what I'm guessing, uh, both you and Sarah, is going to even be more vital because it's going to be very directed to that individualized patient. I mean, it is to somewhat now, but really targeted. And, you know, can, you know, talk a little bit about that. Like, how do you see your roles evolving? And, and then I want to ask you why you chose gastroenterology. So I'll take the first, I'll take the first part. Um, so really, you know, with all the increase in biosimilars, um, there's pharmacogenomics, precision medicine, you know, all the things that you kind of spoke about earlier, you know, all those are really being catered to uh, patient specific treatments. And so having the pharmacist involved in those areas, you know, it's just going to be invaluable. So I think that, you know, we, we think about a pharmacist in, in today and say, okay, all these complex drug regimens are really going to need the pharmacist involvement. And so again, you know, they talk about pharmacogenomics a lot, and we've talked a lot about that, but you know, there hasn't been a big uptake in that yet, but I see that coming in the very near future. It's exciting, I think. So, and so, Sarah, tell me why you chose gastroenterology. I'm curious. Oh, yes. Yeah. So I am really passionate about the management of chronic diseases. So things like diabetes, you know, cystic fibrosis, and especially inflammatory bowel disease. I really believe that helping patients understand not only how their medications work, but also why they are essential in controlling their disease um, can help better equip, equip them, you know, to best understand and manage these uh, chronic or lifelong conditions. 
So in IBD specifically, the majority of our therapy options are considered high-risk medications. Uh, and so as a pharmacist, I feel like I can play a very important role in helping to educate them about side effects, administration techniques, pregnancy considerations, um, and general health maintenance items like Dr. Ali spoke of before. And so I feel like this area, gastroenterology and IBD specifically, is a really fulfilling area for me. I agree. And I'm not a pharmacist or a doctor, but I totally agree. I think it's fascinating. If I was going to be in your shoes, I would pick gastroenterology too. <laughs> and I want to ask this question, you know, in terms of like the patient has a huge role on the healthcare team, right? They're not just sitting there getting, you know, can you do this, this, and this, like we want our patients as a patient myself, we want to be empowered. How can, when a patient works with Sarah or Carrie, and even Dr. Ali, like what are your expectations or what makes the patient more effective as a member of their care team? Like what are some of the qualities or what, what are some of the things that a patient can do to feel like they're more empowered on the care team? Like what are your yeah. tips for that? Does that make sense? Yes, yeah. okay. um, it's it, it actually, uh, it's something that's very um near and dear to me, this concept of, uh, you know, engaging patient. And there is a word that we use, uh, it's called patient activation. So it's not only when you do a shared decision making, when you're making a decision along with the patient, which uh, universally, everyone wants to get involved in the decision making process. Um, you cannot have a successful decision making if your patient are not educated, and they're not activated, which is another higher level of just not merely just receiving the education. Many times, as Sarah alluded that, you know, in IBD, which is a chronic illness, I see patients coming to me for second opinion or for as a referral, and they and I ask them about medication history. So uh, why were you on this X drug or Y drug or Z drug? And their response is like, I don't know, the doctor told me to take this, or I don't know, I they just told oh me God. to start with that. So I, I get really frustrated and I tell them like, hey, the very first thing we're going to do is you're not going to tell me this anymore. You are going to know the reason why you need to be on this medicine, why you're taking this medicine, how this is working for you, and are you achieving the results that you are supposed to achieve? So patient education is very critical. And that's where the role of pharmacists come into play, where the whole collaborative team, multidisciplinary team, the concept comes where you can educate your patient well so that they can make better decisions for themselves and these decisions not only in terms of choice of therapy in in terms of prescription but de-prescription a lot of patients don't want to be on pentoprazole for the rest of their life they're just taking it because nobody asked them to stop their pentoprazole for acid reflux a lot of patients want to get off of biologic therapy without knowing the consequences or without knowing if they have that choice or not so i think that's where the pharmacist can play a very important role, talk to the patient, and then the intimidation of having these discussions with the doctor. Uh, I think there is this little shyness that patient like, I don't know if I should ask this question to my doctor or not. So that takes away like, you know, it's a very different relationship with the pharmacist and it's a different relationships that patients develop. And these relationships are very critical when you are taking care of chronic illnesses. It seems like the patient has a team of providers that are they are with the patient in their journey and, and they just enjoy it because now they're making better decisions for themselves and they're actually seeing better outcomes. Um, so, so that's, that's why it's, 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 it's very fascinating. I love that patient activation. So, so Sarah or, or Carrie or both, when you see a patient, like what, what makes them a good patient for you? And I'm not trying to judge patients, but effective, like, in your, when you're trying to figure out what's the best treatment protocol for them, along with Dr. Ali, like, what do you want to see from the patient that's going to help you make that decision? I think what is really helpful uh, first is patients who are comfortable asking questions. You know, I think some of them, like Dr. Ali alluded to, might have questions, but are too shy to ask them. And I find that my patients who are not afraid to just say, hey, um, you know, can I ask you about this? Or can I ask you about this? That helps me learn more about them um, and help me, you know, guide them into you know, whatever answer that they might need for that. So, you know, I do, I've spent a lot of time discussing fecal calprotectin tests and what that means and, and patients results and things like that. So I think, first of all, you know, the ones that are, are comfortable asking questions. And then I think 
Um, another good trait of patients that is helpful for me is patients who are um, willing to tell me more about their lifestyle and be honest. So when I talk about adherence and the importance of being compliant with our medications, you know, I do have some patients that say, oh no, I don't think I can take a pill every day. I think something that I just remember to go in and get an infusion once every eight weeks or inject every two weeks is better for me. And so when they offer up that information um, to me, that's also helpful. So important. I Well said. Uh, uh, Carrie, anything you want to add to what Sarah just said? Yeah, no, I think that's great. I think that the patients will open up to us quite a bit. Um, you know, they are a little, I feel like what Dr. Ali said earlier, they're a little more leery to, <laughs> to uh, tell the physician if they're not doing something. Um, and so, you know, having someone as kind, you know, Sarah saying, hey, just let me know, you know, um, I don't know. I just feel like that patients having that whole team um, is just, it, is just important. And, and the pharmacist is just, um, you know, an important aspect of that team. So, and there's no dumb questions, right? There's no <laughs> dumb questions, little things like eating grapefruit could affect, you know, our medication, or some people like to have drinks, they go to a party, they don't realize, oh, maybe you shouldn't be doing that. And when you're not there to judge the patient, you're here to make them their treatment plan the most effective so that can they can, in a case of IBD, be in remission and feel better and go on and go to that party or go to that sporting event and and not feel like they can't leave their house. So you guys, you've, you've heard it all. There's no stupid question. There's no embarrassing moment. And we've had countless experts and patients say there's no stupid question and they've heard it all and there's nothing to be embarrassed about, right, Dr. Ali? Yes, uh, that's so true. And that's why um, I encourage them. I, I point them towards good resources. I actually, my younger patients, my young teenagers who come for IBD, I actually even task them that you're going to ask me a question next time. Uh -huh. or I will ask you a question and you better have the answer for that. So um, I sometimes put on my teacher hat there to kind of like give them some homework to do. So just kind of like push them, encourage them to ask questions and kind of like get engaged and not tell me that, I don't know, you just told me to do that. So I'm just doing it. Um, so, so just getting more involved when it comes to chronic care management, that's very critical. This is fantastic. So any final words? I think, did we miss anything? I think this was such an enlightening episode and I can't wait to um, get it out there, but this is, uh, I'm really impressed with all of you and uh, what a model for uh, GI clinics uh, nationwide and good insight for patients to, to really engage and try to find a pharmacist that can really help them and listen to them. Carrie, please tell for those providers that listen, and we do have providers that listen into the Gastro Girl podcast, how can um, a GI practice implement a pharmacist in their in their clinic? Well, again, um, as I said, having a good physician champion, you know, makes all the difference in the world. Um, I think that a lot of what we've done is, you know, we've looked at, you know, what are our outcomes that we're looking for? You know, are we looking for reduced hospitalizations, a reduction in readmissions, you know, looking at it from... Um, the clinical piece, you know, um, patient satisfaction, um, all these different scores that go into um, the not only the financial assessment, but, you know, looking at it from, you know, we, we talk about an ROI perspective, you know, how do we financially um, uh, support these pharmacists? So what we've done is we've just said, hey, let's look at this from, you know, a different approach and say, you know, from a network integrity piece within SSM, you know, uh, keeping our, you know, our prescription business in house, making sure that, you know, we're allowing um, the pharmacist to be able to bill in the fee for service areas, looking at the quality um, outcomes, as I said before, and, and kind of taking that and putting it all together um, to help uh, kind of take that to our CFOs and our um, administrative teams to, to ask, you know, is this going to be something that you're willing to try? Ours was willing to try. And so, um, again, we will be, you know, sharing that information, you know, as we get a little further in, um, in our, in our path with this pharmacist, this is a, a relatively new role for us here. So be sharing that with other healthcare systems. And, you know, that's one of the, probably the last things I will say, you know, collaboration is really key. And Dr. Ali was able to, you know, help us kind of have some collaboration with some other healthcare systems 
um, other IBUD clinics. So we got to, you know, talk back and forth about, hey, what are you all doing? And, and you know, us be able to share that information with them. And so, you know, having the pharmacist supported um, financially by the healthcare system is something that has been an ongoing challenge. So we just have to work together to try to figure that out. As we are evolving, our healthcare system is evolving. Um, I do see that um, one day all gastroenterology practices would have um, uh, a pharmacist. You know, not too long ago, we we didn't have uh, physician assistants and nurse practitioners, and now we realize how important they are in in providing and extending the care to our patients. And I think very soon you will see. Uh, that a pharmacist uh, will be an integral part of all uh, GI practices. Uh, this is fantastic, but thank you very much. And I uh, look forward to um, seeing you all again. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Thank, thank you for having us. Thank you for listening to the Gastro Girl podcast. For more information and resources, please visit gastrogirl.com. Do you have a question for Gastro Girl? Please email podcast at gastrogirl.com. The information, opinions, and recommendations presented in the Gastro Girl podcast are not a substitute for medical advice from your healthcare professional. Please consult a licensed clinician in your state regarding all matters related to your health.